Thank you, Abby. So, um, Dr. Valerie Hudson uh, joined the faculty of the Bush School in 2012. So the Bush School is at Texas A&M University and she holds the George H.W. Bush Chair. She's an expert on international security and foreign policy analysis as well as gender and security. And of course, for many years, she was professor of political science here at BYU. In 2009, foreign policy named her one of the top most, one of the 100 top most influential global thinkers. And she has several books that have been very important in terms of uh, discussions in international relations, global security, politics, and democracy. So I'll just list some of these. So Bear Branches, Security Implications of Asia's Surplus Male Population, uh, The Hillary Doctrine, Sex and American Foreign Policy, and then most recently, um, and this is what she'll be talking to about uh, today to us, right? The First Political Order, How Sex Shapes Governance and National Security Worldwide. Um, so there's many more things I could tell you. She's very accomplished, very distinguished. We're very grateful to have her join us. So please help me, uh, even though there are just few of us in this room, to welcome her uh, virtually to BYU again. Hi, I'm delighted to, to sort of be here. It's all strange to join you uh, uh, in a virtual sense. Um, I have many happy memories of uh, the Kennedy Center Conference Room. And so I'm delighted to see it once more, although far few people, uh, fewer people than we would normally have. And I hope uh, we swiftly get back to a post-pandemic world where we can all join together. Uh, I am here to talk about my new book, but before I do, I want to encourage any of you who are interested in a master's degree in international affairs, a professional master's degree um, leading to employment in the public or private sectors, as well as any of you who are interested in the subfield of women, peace and security, to check out the Bush School of Government and Administration. We have two departments, the Department of International Affairs, as well as the Department of Public Service and Administration. Uh, and we offer only master's degrees. So there's no undergraduate curriculum, there's no doctoral students. Uh, we focus on our students. And we have had an amazing group of BYU students come through the door over the last several years that I've been at the Bush School. So you all have a wonderful reputation that will precede you if you apply. All right, there's enough of that plug. And now it's uh, time for us to talk about our new book. And I'm very excited because my two co-authors are BYU professors, uh, Donnelly Bowen, um, Emerita from Political Science, and Perpetua Lynn Nielsen, who's um, uh, a teaching professor of uh, statistics. So I'm gonna try to screen share now. Just one moment. Okay. So somebody say that you can see this so that I know we're good. We can see it. Okay, great, wonderful. All right, the, um, the title of the book and the title of the presentation is The First Political Order, How Sex Shapes Governance and National Security Worldwide. Uh, and this is the cover of the book. Uh, I hope you get it. It's not light reading, it's over 600 pages, but uh, I view it as more or less the culmination of all of my research over the last 25 uh, years. So um, I'm abridging it down for you uh, and we can certainly talk more in the Q and A se session about um, anything in more in depth uh, that piques your fancy. All right, so, so the, the bedrock from which we launch our discussion is a point that has been made by others before, but which we think needs to be reiterated, which is the very first political order in any society is the sexual political order established between men and women. Sometimes with my uh, classes, I tell them, okay, pretend for a moment that we're in a video game design class. Uh, and I'm gonna give you two parameters and you go make a game for me. And I say the two parameters are that there are uh, two groups within the society 
each of which constitutes approximately half of the total population of players. And the second is that unless uh, these two groups cooperate, there is no second round. The game is over. Uh, at that point, they usually say, oh, but Professor Hudson, we need to know more, right? And the questions they ask me are very interesting. Um, the questions they ask me are, do these two groups, are they equals or is one like a superior group and one's like an inferior group? Um, how are decisions for the group made? Is it made by one of the, the subgroups or by both? How are conflicts resolved between the group? Are they resolved peacefully by consensus or by force and domination? Uh, and lastly, um, how are resources distributed between these two groups? Are they distributed equally or does one group have a, a far larger share of resources than the other? Well, I pause my students there and I say, listen, um, listen to yourselves. These are all political questions. These uh, are about the distribution of power, right? Whether that be um, power over resources, uh, decision-making power, uh, power to resolve conflicts, even power in terms of status. These are political questions. And so the answers, right, of how we order relations between men and women do establish the first political order within a society. All right, so where should we look if we wanted to see that order within a state? Um, for most of my career, I've been interested in looking at measures of women's empowerment, such as female literacy, female labor force participation, and female parliamentary representation. Um, but um, about 12 years ago, when I was still at BYU, um, I had a very interesting conversation. Um, we were hosting um, Afghan members of parliament, female Afghan members of parliament. Uh, and I was assigned to have lunch with one of the uh, members of parliament. And as we were talking, of course, being feeling rather awkward and what, what do we talk about? I was going on about how wonderful it was that she was a university educated Afghan woman. She had been a doctor before becoming a member of parliament. And, you know, wow, didn't this really show that Afghan women were becoming empowered? And she stopped me and she said, wait, Valerie, you don't understand. I could go home today to my home and my husband could divorce me simply by saying I divorce you three times. And if he did, I would lose custody of my children because Afghan custom is to give the father custody of the children. And I would have nowhere to live because my father's family would not take me in. Uh, and she said, even if I, I'm not divorced, I will have very little say in uh, whom my children marry or at what age they marry. So how empowered am I really, Valerie? And as she was sort of discussing this with me, I realized that she was right, all right? This is a university educated female doctor who's a member of parliament and she's telling me that she does not view herself as empowered. Uh, and then that's sort of when I realized that the key to seeing women's empowerment is to look inside the household. So the types of questions I'm interested in asking are, how much say does a woman have about getting married? And how old is she typically when she is married? How much say does a woman have within her marriage about say how household finances are, um, are employed and so forth? What types of property and inheritance rights do women have? Are there inequities in family law such as um, my uh, acquaintance told me about matters of divorce and child custody? Is marriage patrilocal? That is, does the, the woman sort of become moved to the uh, groom's household and become part of their household and stop being part of her own uh, birth family's household? Are bride price or dowry paid? Is polygyny or cousin marriage prevalent? Um, does society view domestic violence and femicide as normal, even expected, even obligatory in certain circumstances? A statistic I learned after talking with my um, Afghan acquaintance is that 87% of Afghan women report having been abused domestically. 
And lastly, is rape treated as a property crime? That is not a crime against the woman who's been raped, but rather is a crime against her guardian, that is either her husband or her father. Um, and I think these are a much better indication of the first political order within a given society. So what you see in front of you, and I hope it's large enough for you, for you to see well, is that um, my co-authors and I posit that there is a syndrome, almost a straitjacket of male mechanisms of control of women that largely operate at the household level. So if we start in the upper left, looking at willingness by males to violently coerce females, uh, and then move to males controlling access to important resources and women, women lacking the ability to control resources such as property, extending to patrilineality, patrilocal marriage, sometimes cousin marriage as well, um, leading to um, a devaluation of the lives of females uh, and a growing son preference within the society, as well as a low age of marriage for girls um, because they are um, more of a burden to their birth family, not really a contributor to their birth family. They're considered to be part of their future husband's family, leading to deep inequity in family law and custom um, and personal status law and custom within the society. And then coming up the left-hand side, we sort of see two different forms um, that this subordination can take. If women's labor, productive labor is valuable, then what usually arises is a bride price society where the groom and his family must pay the father of the bride for um, marriage, uh, along with polygyny, whereby rich men can buy many wives and therefore have the labor of many women. Uh, alternatively, if women's labor is not considered to be valuable, what we see arising is what we call a dowry sex ratio alteration society, where women are really considered a burden uh, and where the um, bride's family has to pay the groom's family to take this burdensome bride off their hands. And as a result, you begin to see sex ratio alteration because if, uh, if a girl is born to you, you're going to have to pay a lot of money when she gets older to get her married. So we see this as a series of interlocking mechanisms that create that first political order as an order of subordination in many societies. But what we would like to assert today, and which is where we've taken this idea, I think a little further, is that this syndrome is really a monster. This is a monstrous syndrome and that it, uh, it eats not just women up, it eats men and children and whole societies. Uh, because as, um, as we've, we've um, discussed uh, among our co-authors, we believe that the type of society um, that is represented by the syndrome is a society built around male kin networks uh, to the severe subordination of women. And we believe that this is going to lead to unfortunate outcomes for the group instability, violence, terror, corruption, autocracy. Why? Because the society then is built upon the first political order, which has the same characteristics, instability, violence, terror, corruption, and autocracy at the household level. We also think that such a society will experience um, other types of consequences, such as poor health, food insecurity, low economic performance, rontierism, demographic woes, and lack of attention to environmental security, because often um, responsibility for these types of things, such as responsibility for feeding the family or responsibility uh, for taking care of the environment um, is, is a strongly gendered task. And when you disempower those caretakers, those caregivers, then you, dis, you, you decrease the amount of care that can be given. So if there's one takeaway that I want you to get from our talk today, it's that what you do to your women, you do to your nation state, right? Uh, and so if we're talking about violence towards women, uh, exploitation of women, corruption and so forth, that's what you're gonna see at the nation state level because the first political order is the bedrock upon which you're building your nation state. 
if we were to map this, um, and we did as part of our research project, I don't think that you, you would see any, um, anything that's very counterintuitive, right? Um, there are areas where you will get virtually all of um, the types of behavior that you saw in that syndrome diagram. Uh, there are other places where the legacy of that is still something that has to be dealt with by the country, such as we see in China. Uh, and then in terms of other countries, those have moved beyond um, the syndrome to a large measure. Um, how can we see the linkages that we're talking about? Well, I'm going to give you two examples. One is uh, uh, a linkage that we could say is very immediate and proximate. And the second linkage is a more long-term and structural linkage. So for the first example, I'd like to talk about surging bride prices. We've talked about bride price as being um, the payment that a groom and his family must make to the bride's family in order for the marriage to be contracted. Um, interestingly, uh, about two thirds of the world's societies um, are bride price based. Um, and so what bride price does is it begins to act as a regressive and universal flat tax on the subpopulation of young men. Except at the very elite levels, there's a going rate for a bride within a society. And what that means is if there is a going rate, it means that even the poorest young men may have to pay that rate. And so they are, they are uh, less likely to be successful in the market. Similarly, Although sometimes forced by governments to remain static, um, bride price tends to resemble more um, something like the real estate market in Utah County, which is it keeps be being pushed higher and higher and higher in kind of an inflationary bubble. And so bride price tends to inexorably rise over time. And sometimes the rise can be extremely um, dramatic and even swift. Um, surging bride prices are also linked to an increased prevalence of polygyny because as bride prices surge, rich men can still buy wives, but poor men are completely priced out of the market. And therefore, uh, in these uh, societies that are based around um, uh, patrilineal male kin groups, a deep sense of grievance among young men, especially disadvantaged young men, is the result because for them, marriage uh, is significantly delayed or even precluded entirely, even though marrying is in fact the way that a young man moves into adulthood in these societies. Well, the consequences of this context is that rebel groups and terror groups um, see the situation as a perfect recruiting context um, offering to solve the problem facing these disadvantaged young men, either by uh, allowing them to access enough resources to pay a bride price, or in fact, kidnapping the girls themselves. And so we do see this, for example, uh, in Northern Nigeria and the rise of Boko Haram there. Uh, something that was not part of the Western narrative about Boko Haram is that there was a huge jump in bride price in northern Nigeria in the 2000s. There was this inflationary but, um, bubble um, that uh, arose, uh, about a 500% jump just over the space of uh, several years. And Boko Haram began to use this as a recruiting strategy. Uh, wives were abducted. Uh, we remember the Chibok girls. But again, something that eluded the Western press is that when these girls were kidnapped, there would always be a token bride price left on the ground as the group left in order to make the marriage legitimate. Uh, one young lady who suffered this fate uh, explained it in this way. She said, in this crisis, these men can take a wife at no extra charge. Usually it is very expensive to take a wife, very hard to get married, but not now. So this subordination of women through bride price actually turned into a grave source of instability for the nation of Nigeria. Uh, my co-author Hilary Matfess and I also traced the very same dynamic in South Sudan and Pakistan. And then an independent researcher has also looked at the role of bride price in stoking um, uh, the, the civil conflict in East Timor. 
Now, as the second example is a longer term and more structural example. And here I'd like to point to um, the increasing masculinization of the world's population. Um, by all rights, in an unmanipulated human population, um, the overall sex ratio should be 98 men per 100 women because women tend to live longer than men. But the, the, the global sex ratio now is 101.8 men per 100 women. Uh, and this can only be the case if there's, you know, well over 100 million approaching um, 200 million missing women in the world. Now, no plague or natural disaster took these women. This is all completely man-made. When I was first studying sex ratios back in 1990, five nations had abnormal sex ratios, and two of them were Hong Kong and Macau that were still uh, independent at that time. But now, surprisingly, we have 18 countries with abnormal birth sex ratios, and these include Albania, Armenia, Azerbaijan, China, now including Hong Kong, Georgia, India, Kosovo, Latvia, Lebanon, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Pakistan, Papua New Guinea, Serbia, Taiwan, Vanuatu, and Vietnam. All right, so these are, this is a troubling phenomenon that has spread. It's also true that the great migration waves of the 2010s have also brought with them alterations in sex ratios. So for example, in 2015, when we had the first major wave of migration to uh, Europe, um, because of the Syrian crisis. Um, the first waves of migrants are almost always um, young men for um, some obvious reasons. Um, and so in 2015, Sweden took in, a, a, a basically opened their doors to migrants. And they also said that anyone who was under 18 would never be deported in the future for any reason. Um, but they didn't have any reliable way to check for age. So virtually all of the young men who went to Sweden claim to be 16 or 17. In 2016, when the Swedes did a population count, what they discovered is that the sex ratio among their 16 and 17 year old population was 123 men per 100 women, which was fascinating because that was actually a far worse sex ratio than that of China among China's 16 to 17 year olds, there's only 117 men per 100 women. Well, alterations, these kinds of really significant alterations of sex ratios have um, uh, noted um, associations with crime rates, especially violent and property crime, as well as political protest rates. Uh, we also see marriage market obstruction, such as we saw with uh, Boko Haram. Uh, China is still a bribe price society, uh, despite the fact that it's communist. And this also leads to recruitment uh, in, um, in, in groups that are, are anti-government. Crimes against women tend to skyrocket, including trafficking and forced prostitution, and mobility restriction for women results. Uh, HIV and STD spread is uh, accelerated dramatically. Uh, and lastly, uh, in our book, Bare Branches, we talk about how there is even an altered calculus of deterrence due to an altered perception of the costs of attrition warfare. Uh, highly masculinized societies may engage in a much more honor-based foreign policy. Uh, very sensitive to any signs of disrespect. And this may also fuel a different view towards attrition warfare. Most countries are consider attrition warfare anathema, but uh, it, some countries, and we argue highly masculinized countries, may not. All right, so is there any statistical evidence uh, to back up the kind of um, analysis that I've given you so far? Well, yes, there is. Interestingly, the uh, US Department of Defense gave us $1.3 million to do the most comprehensive empirical examination of the relationship between female subordination and national security and stability. So we um, 
we had that grant from 2014 to 2018 and were able to produce the analysis that resulted in this book. So the first thing we did is we operationalized the syndrome. And um, uh, I don't know if you know, but Professor Celeste Beasley of um, Brigham Young University's Department of Political Science oversees an outpost of the Women's Stats Project. Uh, and so it, it involved BYU students. In fact, a lot of the work was done by BYU students, operationalizing the 11 components of the system. Uh, and um, then um, uh, professors Bowen and Nielsen and I took the resulting scale and uh, did a wide variety of multivariate regressions using seven control variables. And what we are interested in is looking at the relationship of the syndrome to nine clusters of nation state outcomes, including political stability and governance, security and conflict, economic performance, indicators of economic volunteerism, health and well being, demographic security, education, social progress, and even environmental protection. Uh, and uh, we used a very stringent bar. Uh, for uh, in, um, determining significance, um, and our p-value was 0 0.001. So for those of you who've taken statistics, you know that this is um, far beyond the usual bar for significance in social science research, which tends to be 0 0.05 or 0 0.01. Now you're not meant to read this, uh, this next slide. Um, these are the 122 outcome variables that we examined. Uh, you can see there's all sorts of things from the fragile state index to Freedom House's um, democracy index, violent crime, life expectancy figures, you know, uh, aid, uh, aid per capita, GDP per capita, literacy, environmental protection, we looked at it all. And the reason we took this many variables is that we did not want to be accused of cherry picking certain variables to make our case. And we were also sensitive that sometimes different operationalizations of the same concept can lead to uh, different scorings. Uh, so we took as many as, as we felt we could link, um, theoretically speaking, to the first political order. So what were our findings? Well, the findings even surprised me. Uh, across 22 measures of political instability, 93.8% of the time, the syndrome was the most determinant and significant predictor of those outcomes. For conflict and insecurity, 75%. Across um, a subset of 10 measures of political terror, the most determinant and significant predictor was the measure of women's disempowerment, 80% of the model runs. Economic performance, I was surprised to see 62.5% of the model runs. The syndrome was highly important uh, to economic performance. Um, public health and well being, this one was not a surprise. Almost 71% of the model runs found that disempowering women led to worse national outcomes on public health and well being. Environmental preservation was a big shock to me. Um, I, I had to be talked into including this cluster by my co authors, but they argued that um, the earth is often viewed as a woman, as Mother Earth. And so how uh, you feel about women is going to translate into how you feel about Mother Earth. Uh, and here was the, the highest, 85.7% of our model runs showed the syndrome as being the most determinant and significant predictor. Demographic security, not surprisingly, 71% uh, of the model runs. Educational attainment, 60% of model runs. Social progress, 75% of model runs. So across all the model runs for all of those variables, um, the syndrome was significantly related at the 0 0.001 level in 71.3% of those runs. So if you're not interested so much in regression as you are in odds ratios, we were able to turn it into odds ratios as well. So if for every point worse on that syndrome scale that we discussed, your nation state would um, also have twice the chance of being a fragile state. 
three and a half times the chance of having a government that is more autocratic, less effective, and more corrupt. One and a half times the chance of being unstable and violent. Uh, 1.28 times the chance of experiencing terrorism. 1.4 times the chance of the country being poor and in economic decline. One and a half times the chance of having a low GDP per capita. One and a half times the chance of having low environmental quality. Almost twice the chance of having a high fertility rate. Almost twice the chance of a higher incidence of preventable deaths. And almost twice the chance of scoring worse on the global hunger index. Um, Professor Rose McDermott of Brown University, who was reviewing this work, said something that I thought was very striking. Um, and she, she said, these findings are clear, consistent, and statistically robust across the board. In fact, the results are the kind of thing that most social scientists strive for, but almost never find in the course of their careers. If these findings were about something not related to women, chances are they would be treated as revolutionary in international relations theory. Indeed, the effects are much stronger than those supporting the notion of the democratic peace that has spawned an entire cottage industry of inquiry. I leave it to the reader to ponder why powerful effects regarding the treatment of women on the health and security of states do not receive such extensive attention. And I think she's got a point. Why do we get these results, right? Well, I, I think we've talked about some of the reasons, but let me make sure that you understand them. Number one, if you have a first political order of the subordination of women compared to men, then this is a boot camp for every single person in your society. There is no better training ground or training camp for political violence and instability than lived domestic terror perpetration, lived domestic corruption and exploitation, lived domestic autocracy. Um, it's a very, very powerful effect. Second, as we talked about with the Boko Haram and sex ratio uh, examples, this syndrome also creates chronic structural goads to engaging in political violence, such as inflationary bride price, prevalent polygyny, and sex ratio alteration. These kinds of phenomenon are at their root destabilizing to a human society. And lastly, uh, the reason that this, these linkages are seen is because you're disempowering specifically women. That is the very individuals whose influence could profoundly change the calculus of political violence. You are muting their voices disproportionately compared to other voices. So a lot of times when I give this presentation in DC, I'll ask the question, are you a national security realist? And of course, everyone in the field of national security, myself included, will say, of course, I'm a realist. And then I say, well, then let's talk. In light of the empirical findings I've just shown you, are you a realist if you believe the treatment of women affects the security, stability, governance, resilience, health, wealth, demography, education, and social progress of a nation? And are you a realist if you believe the women, peace and security agenda is absolutely in the national interest? And then I ask them, can you call yourself a realist if you don't, um, given what we have discovered with this research? So at that point then, when my DC audience is prepared to suggest that maybe what's going on with women really do matter in national security, they ask, well, okay, so what changes, right? Would anything change at all if we believed that what you're telling us is true? And I say, well, think about it. If the US isn't tracking the situation of women, how's it gonna to expect to have an effective foreign policy? For example, how will it accurately anticipate instability in other countries if it's unaware of linkages related to things such as bride price and polygyny? How will the US decide which subnational actors in a civil conflict are most likely to bring stability in the long term if it doesn't first examine how each group treats women before making such a commitment? So for example, when we talk about who we're going to back in say the Syrian conflict, is anyone asking, well, how does each of these groups treat women and how, how are they, uh, projecting that they're gonna treat women once they get into power. We're not asking that question at all, but obviously we should, because the actors that are talking about treating women better are the actors that are most likely to bring stability to that nation. 
How would the U.S. avoid the trap of peace negotiations where the rights of women are bargained away to make peace between warlords if it doesn't understand the linkage between sustainable peace and the empowerment of women? And of course, this is very timely as we talk about um, the Afghan peace talks right now. Uh, we've already seen the Taliban increasing their attacks against women and against uh, girls' schools. This is not the foundation for a healthy um, peace negotiation. How will the U.S. track which of its own citizens are the greatest internal threat if domestic violence is not taken seriously? I think this is, is really important. As we talk about those who have bombed or those who have mass shooters here in the United States, almost to a man, they have been accused of or arrested for or convicted of domestic violence against the women in their lives, girlfriends, wives, even their mothers and sisters. Why aren't we taking domestic violence seriously as a predictor of domestic terror? How will the U.S. rationally approach immigration policy if it doesn't comprehend that the true clash of civilizations is not about a religion or ethnicity, but about the first political order, about whether you advocate the subordination of women? How will the nation state understand that tolerating enclaves of family and personal status law that subordinate women will destabilize their society? This is really important. Australia now includes questions on its citizenship exam about whether it is uh, okay to beat your wife, whether it is okay to have your daughter undergo female genital cutting, right? Uh, and um, this is something that has become, I think, a, a more important part of the discussion about immigration. How will the US know that ending child marriage worldwide would do more for world peace than almost any other investment it could make? Maybe we should place a pause on exporting democracy, and maybe we should tackle the first political order as a foundation, as a precondition for democratization. And certainly ending child marriage would be one of the most important things that we could help with. So following on that, how would the US know when exporting democracy makes sense and when it doesn't? Right? It makes sense when the first political order is altering towards greater equality between men and women. Exporting democracy makes a lot of sense there. But if you're trying to export democracy to a full-blown syndrome nation, don't be surprised when that doesn't work out well. I believe that one day the idea that foreign policy or national security policy could ignore the situation of women will be seen as laughably naive. I believe that, that those in the future um, will look back on our time and just shake their heads that this is something that we, by and large, did not discuss. So I, I suggest a rethinking of national security. Given the many outcome dimensions examined, it's fair to say that women's insecurity profoundly and significantly undermines state security. I think Hillary Clinton put it best in 2012 when she was Secretary of State when she said, the subjugation of women is a threat to the common security of our world and the national security of our country. And I think disrupting the weak points of this syndrome, the weak points of a subordinate first political order may be foundational to undercutting the roots of instability, conflict and ineffective governance. And I think only by adopting women, peace and security lenses can we see these linkages and make our foreign and security policies more effective. All right, that's all that I had to say, and I am really excited. The best part of these, these uh, events for me is actually the, the Q&A. So I am excited to, to hear what you all have to say. Uh, Hudson, what, what your name is, what you're studying, and then ask your question. So, please. Yeah, it's, it's in the ceiling, so just speak loudly, and she should hear you. 
Okay, I'm Ashley. I'm studying Asian studies and emphasis on Korea. And I'm wondering how, whether cousin marriage is normalized impacts this stuff. Does that have to do with patrilocality or is it something totally different? Okay. Oh, that's a brilliant question. I'm so glad you asked. Is um, when I first started this research, Ashley, I had no idea that cousin marriage was a big thing, right? Um, and yet, in um, in that in those syndrome countries that we talk about, um, cousin marriage is very common. And the reason is that um, when you marry your cousin, um, the bride price will stay within the family. Uh, and as a result, you often see um, actually exchange cousin marriages where one family will give a bride to um, a, a, a cousin family and that family will give a bride to the first family. Uh, and um, the reason is, is that um, bride prices, as you can imagine, uh, can be very, very significant. And so you can, especially with an exchange, nobody gets paid at all. You, you can marry without bride price at all because the two bride prices would cancel each other out. But even marrying within um, you know, the, the kin group allows you to drastically lower the amount of bride price. So for example, when I was in the United Arab Emirates, I managed to have a focus group conversation with a number of Emirati women. And they were talking about the prevalence of cousin marriage and how actually when, a, uh, when boys and girls are born, the, the tribe, right, the extended um, male bonded kin group will actually say, okay, when she gets to this age, she's marrying this boy baby, right? That, that actually the arrangements are made within the cousin group, even at birth. And this is done to prevent um, what anthropologists call the alienation of resources from the kin group. That is the, the loss of, um, of wealth um, due to bride price. Noah, I'm a media arts major. Um, when you were talking about what changes when we become realists, you brought up actors. And I'm curious um, what kind of role, you know, celebrity and public figures will play versus politicians in rethinking our national security, especially on the level of the United States, um, and what you have to say about that. Oh, that's very interesting. I don't. I didn't realize that I had said the word actors. I probably meant um, human agents. But if if the question is more broadly uh, focused on what role can people in the spotlight or people who are um, social influencers pay uh, play in turning these things around, absolutely positively. Um, for example, in India, there have been some. Um, uh, very socially influential families that have refused right, to accept or pay dowry. Um, that hasn't, as you can imagine, hasn't completely changed the mindset of the nation, uh, but the idea that there are elites who are willing to diverge from these um, traditional uh, mechanisms of female subordination, I think are extremely important. Um, in, I know here in the West, People like Emma Watson um, and others um, have used their influence to try to suggest that a society that's based on the equal partnership of men and women is a far happier and more functional society. And I think that um, the work that she's doing uh, among uh, her generation is astounding and, and laudatory. May I ask a question from Zoom? Okay, go for it. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm Emily, I'm a music performance major. I read your New York Times article um, that was like the Reader's Digest version breakdown of your work. Um, and one of the lines really struck me when you said, the household is the training ground for the relationship between men and women. And I wanted to ask, um, because of our faith, what has the family proclamation or what has um, your faith meant or basically given to you on the research and the um, work you want to do for women worldwide? Well, I, I, I don't think it's, it's any um, 
um, secret that it has influenced it greatly. Uh, and that in, in a sense, what I see in my own empirical findings is kind of a, a, a um, corroboration of the family proclamations idea that to the extent that we do not have an equal partnership between men and women, uh, that nations are cursed instead of blessed. I, I, I think it's really um, provable that nations that highly subordinate women uh, come out worse on virtually every outcome measure that you would want. Uh, and so that means something to me as a member of this faith community, of our faith community, the Church of Jesus Christ, right? It, it means to me that uh, God perhaps blesses nations that work toward that equal partnership between men and women. And I think that while uh, our particular um, uh, church has made immense progress towards that, I think there's more. I think there's greater light and knowledge that's coming. Uh, I think there are even uh, additional changes. Um, I think we're all excited for when the temples will go to phase two or whatever, and we can see these additional changes, you know, to the ceremonies there. Um, you, something that will put this in perspective is that when I was a professor at BYU, um, I would get these um, strange phone calls and, and emails out of the blue and people would even show up at my office door. And, you know, they would say, I'm not sure I can stay in the church, right? I just went to the temple. I'm not sure I can stay in the church. Help me through it. Talk me through it. You know what? Since, since the changes were made to the temple ceremony, I've not had a single one of those interactions. Right. So I think we really are moving into the greater light and knowledge, but there is a lot more to come. Uh, and if you want to see my readings as kind of a, a, a feminist in the Church of, of Jesus Christ, um, I do uh, co-edit an online journal called Square Two. And so if you look for that, you can find um, my writings there. Thank you. Uh, let me, uh, I'm going to ask a question that I'm uh, curious about. Um, what about, do you see evidence, this, this link that you so persuasively show between uh, the domestic order, the first political order, and these national indicators for um, a country that maybe is taking a turn towards authoritarianism, like maybe say Turkey? You know, do you see a link still showing up when they've sort of made progress in one direction and then you see of an authoritarian ruler take control, anything like that? Turkey's a great case. And what's interesting is that um, one of the co-PIs on the Women's Stats Project is a professor in Turkey. And so um, she and I have had um, uh, personal conversations about what's going on. And she really, really sees that the turn towards authoritarianism in Turkey is linked to rollback of women's rights uh, and increasing insecurity for women in Turkey. Uh, and, and I think this, this makes a fascinating case study. Uh, at, and believe it or not, even though I've urged her to write about it, the situation in Turkey is such that she feels that she would possibly be in danger if she did. Uh, and, and so um, I'm actually thinking about peace uh, if I can do so in a way to not in any way endanger her, that talks about how the, the move towards authoritarianism by Erdogan and the movement, the backlash against women's rights um, go hand in hand and reinforce one another. Uh, so I think that's a very cogent uh, observation that you've made there, Stan. Um, I'm Abby Woodfield. I said the prayers, but... I'm a poli sci major mostly, and then a psych also major. And um, I'm really interested in the implications that your research has for democratization, I guess, um, because I'm kind of having a hard time saying, okay, well, would democratization solve a lot of the issues that you talk about relating to the syndrome, or like would addressing issues related to the syndrome um, lead to democratization? So I guess like what comes first? democracy or fixing the issues? Well, all you have to do is look historically. Which are the nations that um, 
got democratized first. Uh, we have an entire section of the book where we talk about this. Uh, and it turns out that it's the nations that um, severely departed from the syndrome. So for example, the, the, the quote unquote birth of democracy um, <clears throat> in Northwestern Europe, right? Where, where it stayed and didn't go away like we see with um, the Greeks um, was uh, a society that had during the dark ages begun to depart from um, these syndrome components. So up until Northwestern Europe made a change all over the world, every part of the world, the dominant marriage pattern was uh, girls at puberty, that is 12, 13, 14, were being married to grooms that were usually 10 or more years older than they were, right? Setting the stage, right? That's a, that's a very unequal marriage relationship there. So every single marriage was a marriage of an obvious superior to an obvious inferior and set the stage for that first political order very neatly. Uh, and uh, of, of course, uh, this changed in Northwestern Europe uh, and through a series of very interesting um, developments, including developments in tax law and property holding, it actually uh, became an incentive for farmers, if they wanted to increase their land holdings, to keep the size of their families large. And that meant that they had an incentive to delay the marriage of their girls. So in Northwestern Europe, we see this fascinating phenomenon where, yeah, at one point they're marrying 12 year olds off to, you know, 25 year olds. And then over time, it starts going like this where they're marrying off 22-year-old girls to 24-year-old boys. Now, when you marry a 22-year-old girl off to a very different kettle of fish than marrying a 12-year-old off to a 25-year-old. And it, became, it began to change, right? The whole dynamic of the household. Rather than an obvious hierarchical relationship, you see an obvious equal partnership begin to develop. And this is also the time period where women began, especially poor women, began to work more as domestic servants uh, and actually had access to their own income. So I would argue that it was in fact a deep change in the first political order of Northwestern Europe that led to its eventual democratization. So I urge you, if you can, to buy the book and go directly to part three, which is all about change and how it occurred historically and how it might occur in the future. Hi, my name is Emily Kwan. Um, I'm actually a computer engineering major. And I just found, uh, like, you're just seeing that data and, and the results that you, you uh, were able to find. It was really quite amazing. Um, and I just wanted to ask you about um, maybe specific areas or connections that you thought were um, especially compelling that you want to explore more in the future. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad you asked that because as you can imagine, as an academic, my job is to be curious about things. Uh, and I, I still can't believe people pay me to be curious about things and go out and ask questions and answer. <laughs> But um, I'll tell you some of the projects I'm currently doing. One of the projects uh, that I'm, I'm doing is looking at um, marriage migration. I think you know that people are very interested in waves of migration, right? And of course, especially in Europe, people are very interested in migration. But what has never been part of the data on migration is the data about migration for the purposes of marriage. And so given my work on sex ratios, we've noted sort of the deepening uh, dearth of marriage age women in India and China, but also some ancillary countries such as Vietnam and others. Uh, and we're, we're asking ourselves, what, um, what are the flows of women like uh, in terms of moving from areas with a better sex ratio to areas that have a worse sex ratio. 
So we know there is brisk, uh, a brisk marriage market trade into China from other nations. Um, so all of the border areas. In fact, um, one North Korean expert once um, joked that the foremost export of North Korea was women to China. Um, but there's a lot of, of interesting interplay there because some of the other nations in uh, East Asia also have uh, a lack of women. Uh, and then contrasting that with the marriage market surrounding India. And there, as you know, there's sectarian differences that make it difficult for India to, to sort of pull in uh, uh, girls from Pakistan and Bangladesh. And so what we see is the rise of an intrastate marriage market in India, where girls from the south and the east of India are exported to the north and the West uh, of India to fulfill uh, the demand for, for brides. So that's one of the things that I'm, I'm currently uh, looking at, uh, as well as, as looking at, um, we're doing uh, a more extensive look at the linkages between women and health. Um, I think people are interested in that linkage now because of COVID. So we're extending our analysis there as well. So yeah, there, I've always got a few irons in the fire. Um, so I'm glad that you asked that question. Hi, Valerie, I have, I have one question. I'm a journalism major. And with conversations I've had with friends or with, you know, men and women in my family and friend group, um, it seems like people are willing to accept that there are like really bad issues with the treatment of women in other countries, you know, they point out Africa, but are often willing to have conversations about that in the United States or they'll downplay it or say, you know, like women make up allegations because they have, you know, they, they can benefit from it. I guess like, how do you have conversations about that? Where like that, that topic of domestic violence and treatment of women is uncomfortable for some people. It is uncomfortable. Um, and, and, you know, that's a little surprising to me. Um, but then when I look at our nation, um, in terms of its comparison to other nations, you know, we, we have um, a very high rate of violence against women in our society. Um, it's, you know, it's higher than, for example, some of our um, uh, NATO allies, right? We, we're not sort of a shining beacon of light in terms of women's security uh, in the world. Um, and so I, I think that I also sense a period of backlash against women I was so pleased when the Me Too movement came along and it actually snagged some of the richest and most powerful men in its uh, dragnet. But I knew there would be backlash as well and, and distraction because these issues of the first political order, if you will, run through the heart of every single household in the United States of America. Uh, and in um, households where equal partnership between men and women is, is not viewed as optimal, um, those, I think those households are prepared to really push back against um, the idea that this equal partnership is, is the way towards a better future. But I'm gonna say something that I, I hope you'll understand after you've listened to my presentation, which is no matter what kind of ism you wanna fight, you can't fight it uh, successfully, unless you fight sexism, right? Because even if um, consider a society in which there are no no ethnic differences, no religious differences, no racial differences, all right? Consider a homogeneous population, okay? There can still be sexism, all right? Because women are the first other to men; they are the first people who are not like them. And how men treat women is going to be the template for how they think it is correct to treat every other person that has a difference with them. So to me, the subtext, even underneath our, our current moment that was um, initiated by the, the George Floyd tragedy, there's an unspoken subtext here that we're not looking at, which is the first political order. And I think that has to be attended to. In terms of how you handle those conversations, perhaps you're talking about conversations within your own family. There's so many statistics now 
uh, that it would be impossible for the person that is arguing that violence against women is not a problem to stand. Um, when I, I teach my class at the Bush School, the foundational class in women, peace and security, it's called Women and Nations. When I teach my Women and Nations class, I insist that I actually memorize some of these statistics. Because when you're in one of these discussions, it is simply not enough to say, but that's not true. You really need to have memorized some of the important statistics so that you can say, that's not true. The rate of domestic violence in our nation is X and has been increasing since the year Y. Um, so I, my approach, perhaps it's informed by being an academic, is let's look at the real empirics. Thank you. OK, thank you so much, uh, Professor Hudson. Really uh, grateful for your presentation, uh, and especially in these unusual circumstances, uh, really uh, an engaging presentation. So there are just a few of us left. We can't give you the applause you would normally have, but uh, we're really grateful for uh, joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. I had a ball. <laughs>